the theme for the uh, afternoon talk is uh, seven factors of enlightenment. <coughs> Sometimes in uh, taking some measure or degree of uh, interest in the uh, <coughs> Dharma teachings, some people kind of get the idea that uh, the uh, Buddhist tradition is rather solely, it's not exclusively concerned with, uh, with suffering and all the problems that come out of uh, suffering and trying to answer and resolve and uh, bring them to an end and certainly that aspect and feature of the teachings uh, is present is emphasised and there is a strong encouragement and uh, endorsement to genuinely really look into life and sometimes when we really bring the power of attention and awareness to things to issues which are troubling us some of the persuasive grip of them begins to loosen up and it isn't unusual for us to perhaps be going through a very hard time in some way or other and there's rather an inner voice that's going on coming from some deep place some place almost beyond the mind so, so to speak which is telling us and informing us it really isn't that important it really doesn't matter that much so we can be kind of immersed in some issue of life which oneself and others may agree is incredibly important or terribly sad or, or horrible thing to happen Whatever, whatever it is. And yet, in spite of what's going on, that uh, inner voice may still be coming through and really kind of puncturing all that's been built up in some way or other. And to give a small example of what I mean with regard to that is a friend who's a writer and a psychotherapist came to uh, see me this was uh, some time ago and he was having uh, these things happen and I'm sure a few of you in the hall can share no of this had been in a relationship for some time and had decided, he and his uh, wife, to purchase a home. And they had looked hither and thither, as people tend to do, and finally found a place which they liked, signed the contract, and were then ready to move into the home that they had bought, and the first one, in fact, that they had bought. The day before moving in, she decided she didn't want to move in, she didn't want to live with him anymore, and left him. And it seemed to him, he didn't pick up any signal, no messages, no indicators, and she walked out and refused all contact. And he was shell shocked as I might imagine, he just had no inkling that this would happen. So, he came, and one thing that I remember when we were looking in, uh, uh, into all of this, there's another story I could just love to tell you, but then you might, those of you who know me, might figure out who I'm talking about, so I'm not going to tell you any more information. Um, and in the middle of it he was, he, was, he was in tears he was sobbing 
how could this, you know, have happened? And then he said a rather beautiful one-line statement that right in the middle of the tears uh, and uh, the sense of loss and what happened and some feeling of betrayal and all that pain that goes on, he said right in the middle of it, deep down though, Christopher, everything is okay. Deep down, everything is okay. So sometimes there are these waves that roll through us through the circumstances of uh, life and there is just enough awareness to embrace the wave and to experience and to see and to know that deep down everything is okay. Sometimes of course even deep down everything feels definitely not okay. But the awareness has this capacity to rather accommodate much of what is going on from the upper levels, from the waves, and, and from the depth. In the seven factors of enlightenment, and each one of these factors is important and significant, the first one, the word is sati, S-A-T-I, and it means both mindfulness and awareness and in Dharma language the way that I use it here Dharma language um, mindfulness is being mindful of what we do being mindful of the moment giving care and attention to uh, they and the things that we are engaged in this is what I mean by mindfulness being a mindful human being and we all appreciate that in mindfulness that we're less likely to be careless, less likely to cause ourselves grief through uh, being speedy or trying to do too much or not being very conscious, etc. <coughs> and awareness is a genuine um, abiding presence which is contribu- contributing to seeing much more clearly whatever it, it might be. And so, in that awareness, we may pick up something that's going on with us, we're quite clear about it, and we may, if the wisdom is there, follow it through, we may just be with it, we may uh, let it go, we may observe it uh, changing, etc. So mindfulness awareness is what's meant by this uh, sati, and it's referred to as the uh, first factor of enlightenment. In bringing mindfulness awareness um, to our uh, uh, situation, that means that we are really genuinely getting to know ourselves. And it's the vehicle by which we do that. So that if we take care and look at what what our day is. We say, okay, I've been practicing mindfulness, sitting and walking and eating and listening, uh, etc. But we then also can also ask ourselves, during today, what has been important for me to be aware of? During today, what do I really need to be clear about? And that kind of um, um, interest helps to cultivate and develop this factor. And sometimes there are things going on with us which requires some change, external change or inner, inner change. And that requires from us some commitment and some resolution and a lot of things during the flow of a retreat can begin to stand out for us. And the awareness is seeing something which is important and is, is valuable, but in some situations it also requires actually taking some steps. 
And sometimes we need to be with, or we need to move on, or we need to take make a change, or take risks in some way, or other, or be more adventurous, or explore in a fresh way, whatever it may be. But the first signal for all of that in life is the awareness. But sadly, sometimes we're all too aware of what needs to be done, or needs to be changed, or needs to be followed through, or needs to be accepted. We're all too aware, and that's all we are. Just aware. Blindly aware, hopelessly aware, foolishly aware. <coughs> we're aware, and we just live, ugh. Because there's nothing following on from it. And some people, especially the Buddhists, have got some loopy idea that there's no seven factors of enlightenment, there's only one, being mindful. So there's all these books. By the way, far too many of you are making the pilgrimage into the library and... Um, uh, any more going, there won't be a book left in the place. So if you could um, regard that as the back of beyond and return the book. Um, so sometimes all these books, all this mindfulness <laughs> and the reading about it, <laughs> what there is to read about, I don't know. But anyway, all this mindfulness Sometimes we put, as it were, we've got this idea from the Buddhist that uh, if we're mindful, that's all we need to be. Just be mindful. And there's lots of uh, importance on, on that. But as I say, how easy forgetfulness and neglect and uh, in this case of these other factors of enlightenment uh, occur. Because too much in the Buddhist world, especially in this tradition, I have, I have to say, um, put too much emphasis on one thing, being mindful. So if one takes the body of the teachings here, the second factor, a very important one, very this Dharma Vichara, meaning this uh, inquiry, this looking into, this interest in, this investigating, say I. And I think in, in that, and this may be because of um, um, ed- education, which I'm not the, the uh, uh, greatest uh, fan, and somebody, an educator, was trying a few weeks ago to convince me um, of the great values of uh, 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 education and going to school from the age of five to twenty-five or, or, or so. And he said, well, if you're going to ha- have a long education, it teaches you to think. And I said, yes, that's the whole problem. (laughs) So, sometimes, in the inquiry, in the exploration, we have a rather strong tendency, and I think we need to uh, 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 shift this one, to bring in two kind of um, questions. And if we change the mode of the question, possibly we may change the way of response. What I've got in mind here is we usually start with how or why. Something is arising. And we've got our well-educated mind. I'm using that in quotation marks, because I mean the opposite. And our well-educated mind tends very quickly and very easily to run to how or why. So something is going on for us, and we're having a hard time. And then we say, well, why am I feeling like this? Why am I experiencing this? Why do I have to go through this? Why? And then the poor old mindset goes into the known 
and it drags out of itself a, a few wretched answers and one brings those answers to the question why and then one feels even worse <laughs> because one views the same old mind and all the various causes and conditions and reasons and adds it and is more or less saying I've got a fire going on in my mind I'll dig out, I'll ask why, I'll dig out some answers and this will be more wood for the fire and so sometimes one feels through the why question why? and then we pick out things so we pick out things externally of course and often we'll pick a few good causes and good reasons which makes me feel like I do or think like I do or act like I, I do and there's always a few popular targets around that we can uh, uh, pick out the nearest and the dearest are usually the favourites but then it could be something from the past events of course or groups or organisations or places or whatever it may be so we ask why and then from the why we select and my God, we love selecting. But we don't ask, why do I select that? No, we, 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 we think we really have a handle on it through the answers that we get. This is why. And rather, similarly, we introduce how. Rather, rather similar. How, how do I end up like this? And this, how do I end up like this, also starts, we might start digging into the past and we bring out, again, we're very, very selective of a whole variety of different uh, uh, re reasons and those reasons pile into the, pr into the present or we get some others to uh, help dig out some fresh reasons, you know, the professionals and the non-professionals. And all of that um, meets and there is a genuine and perhaps quite deep and heartfelt struggle to try to understand. And we sense that if we can, if we inquire, and that inquiry can bring us to um, an understanding, true, that understanding will help to dispel and help to break up the problem or the difficulties that beset us. But sometimes, as we all know, and sometimes rather painfully, that the how and the why doesn't seem to bring the understanding. It sometimes can help to make the situation feel, as I said before, rather worse. And we can feel more stuck and more crap and more troubled either because what another or others is doing to us and why they're doing it uh, etc and all the intentions and motives that we imagine accurate or not or from the past or from our way we are in the present <coughs> so what would it be to inquire without how and why what would it be to inquire in which one isn't looking for causes either inside of oneself or outside of oneself or both and not using that all too typical response then what would inquiry be? because we're not going outside of ourselves and we're not as it were going into the past which is inside of ourselves the interest is going to be different the attention is going to be different. In the Zen tradition, <coughs> one of the um, much loved uh, questions of inquiry to show a different kind of um, response is what is this? What is it? So there may be some difficulties arising, whatever they 
whatever they are. And there is awareness of those difficulties, that's the first factor of yeah. enlightenment. There is a second factor of enlightenment, of the inquiry. What is, what, what is this? So rather than trying to find methodologies, how and why, or method and technique to get rid of as quickly as possible, and sometimes that means for us there's a kind of pushing away going on, we actually ask ourselves, what is this? What is actually going on? Is this arising, just arising, just a past? Is this just something coming out of the multiple conditions that are, that are taking place? Is it any more than just some feeling, some thought, some images, and a lot of um, unpleasant sensations going along with it? Is it any more than that? Could it be any more than that? Whether it's manifesting in the body, whether it's manifesting in feelings in the heart, thoughts and images and ideas, is there anything more substantial to it than that? And sometimes we look in that way, we inquire in that way, and possibly there might be a little glimmer of light and saying any mind state which I've ever had in my entire existence can, ever, can never have been anything more than some strength of unpleasant feelings, unpleasant thoughts, unpleasant images, unpleasant ideas, all mixed in together and on the boil. And that's all it could ever be. And sometimes we get a sense through all of that. A, a little light of awareness begins to come through all of that. And there's a kind of fading of the interest to make much of little. No one is going to say, well, the first time that one explores this, Oh, everything's just going to, uh, um, whatever you say, uh, di- disappear, disappear like a, a small cloud hit by the sun, or whatever. But it may be more healthy and more beneficial for us to really watch this how and why mind that goes on, and rather instead just to. B, bring the light up, take a real interest in, and really ask, is there anything really substantial in all of this? Is there anything more than just a fluctuating state of mind going on? And that's all it is. you like a bucket of water? <laughs> or a cup? There's a sensor over there. And a glass as well. Another important factor, in the factor of uh, enlightenment, is uh, uh, the, the Pali word is viraya. Kind of English, nearest English word would probably be virility. That probably has some close connection, but it gets translated as uh, as energy. And I hear a lot, and perhaps you look into your own life as well. Uh, um, 
over the days and over the years, and perhaps increasingly more so in recent years, lots and lots of talk about uh, energy, about levels of energy, or how much energy uh, one, one has. And uh, there's a great deal of concern as well from people uh, around uh, energy. And I hear, again, in, in, in uh, every retreat, in, in fact, the references to energy and people experiencing and feeling a lowering of their energy or a loss of energy or a fading of energy. And, of course, the uh, medical profession and given all these various diagnoses, uh, etc., etc. And it can be of real concern to any person if the strength of the energy is noticeably fading and noticeably uh, uh, getting less in various ways. And sometimes we have an idea, and the idea is as, as probably as much a curse or a problem as anything else, that the idea is often that we should have more energy. Where we've adopted this idea from God only knows, or not even God has a clue. <laughs> but we've somehow got this idea that we should have more energy. And, and then we see, you know, whatever, various ideas of, of the media and others of um, uh, people, people living high energy life and... Uh, people with lots of energy, etc., that we meet, or whatever it might be. But very unfortunately, it then feeds into ourselves. And then we get the idea we could have more uh, energy. And there is something about the uh, intensity of people's lives, and particularly the doing and the gaining idea, that one should be doing more and needs to be doing more, but somehow is actually <coughs> violating and abusing life and our levels of energy. And so much of this desire to, to have more energy is not around being human. It's back again to this idea that one's worth is not as a human being, one has little regard for that anymore, one's work is as a human doing. And the measurement and the value is taken on the doing and not on the being, through role, through achievement, through accomplishment, through possession, through ownership, through status, through that whole ego nonsense. But in terms of being, that doesn't require that amount of energy. It genuinely doesn't. And I think we need to genuinely give more support to uh, each other and show more kindness and friendship to uh, each other. And one of the ways to, to, to do that is to be respectful to e each other. So, when a person is asked, oh, what are you doing? And the person says, well, at the present time, nothing. No, no, actually not doing anything. One should bow down to that person and say, <laughs> I salute you, I applaud you, you're, 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 you're more in touch with the real world. Because we've got this idea that there about the, the doing, and if someone isn't doing very much, or doing very, uh, uh, very little, when the forces around are so busy, neurotically busy in many, ca uh, many cases, in order to justify their absurd existence, it creates a divisive culture. And for those people um, who would 
far prefer to hang out than do and live a more minimalist kind of uh, life tend to be on the receiving end of a tremendous amount of disapproval whereas I think and some of us think actually it's those who do less and do little and a more minimalist kind of uh, uh, lifestyle are much closer to what existence is all about than, than those running around, working their butt off morning, noon and, and night to pay for a mortgage or whatever. And there's such a pressure on people with using energy and making energy and uh, all, all, all of that. And I think in some cases one wants to have a more uh, spacious uh, uh, lifestyle, then reduce everything. The intelligent life is not upwardly mobile, it's downwardly mobile. And, and to find ways to be content with much, much less. Content with much, much less. <coughs> and some people are willing, and finding ways, willing to actually make those kind of steps and to, to live like that and to be true to that and just uh, punctured the mythology that as people in a society we have to keep working, 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 working I think it's a pointless existence and therefore if we're quietly determined we can make those kinds of shifts and therefore the sense of energy will be more appropriate, more applicable, and there will be just enough energy. We don't need too much. It doesn't take a lot of energy to lift one's eyelid up a centimetre. And that could be quite enough for one day, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Just to go against the 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 the, 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 the current the current of me. And sometimes when I'm uh, in in uh, the cities, and I have to travel through quite a lot of cities, like some of them, the, the hours that people are are, are working is going in early in the earlier and early in the morning and staying. Uh, uh, late, late in the e evening, hours and hours, work and work and work. It just takes the joy and the fun out of life and the, the play out of life. And for what? So it's going to take some kind of, uh, to awaken our life, to enlighten our life. For some it's going to take quite a, a revolution of uh, looking and attitude and, and change and taking risks and being feeling okay with a lot less and being comfortable with what is rather than this constant dissatisfaction that one wants more and more and make and making things last and, and doing without things. I don't want to boast or anything, but a couple of uh, years ago when my um, nineteen eighty um, three, uh, what was it, uh, Toyota Carina, which I'd bought off a farmer's friend for about 300 quid because he went off to India. And then it, cla it clapped out, you see, uh, uh, tend to do. So, rather than get another one, I thought, well, hang out without a car. And then friend said, oh, you can't live without a car. You know, living, living in top mess, you know, the bus that turns up once a month if you're lucky, <laughs> etc. How are you going to get anywhere without a car living in, in a small country town? So I thought, well, I'll, I'll give it. I took a one-year vow, no car for a year, and just, just see. And so buses came, and I, I realised there are four kinds of people on the bus. <laughs> no, no, four kinds of people who use the bus service there. Yeah. The poor, <laughs> there. <coughs> the young, 
the elderly and the drunk. <laughs> and Dharma teachers. <laughs> Anyone can sit on the bus, can read a book, hang out, and we've got all these bills to pay uh, out. And sometimes, if one, because one's saving money, one needs to use a, a, a taxi to get to go out for some reason. And, uh, see uh, a friend and the hours are difficult, one, one does it. Let's take it as a very small example. It's now two years now, I've been uh, out the car and I haven't missed it uh, at all. And I uh, did a little count up. And I, it worked out that I was worth giving about. This is a rather crude way of doing it. And I could turn the tape recorder off at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and I reckon I was doing at least three retreats a year just to run this car so I thought, well, gee, every holiday would be better <laughs> but anyway <laughs> I've tried not to speak in such mercenary terms so, I <laughs> so sometimes just the taking the step of doing without and, and uh, being without and making more space in our space in our lives it, it, it allows uh, their sense of uh, vitality and energy and, in, and enjoyment and so being it doesn't require a tremendous amount of energy it genuinely doesn't and I think out of that can come a sense of harmony and well-being no matter what the level of energy is and a sense of quietly being present to what is, as I say ears open, eyes open connectedness it's more than enough one existence. So the Buddha, I think quite rightly and appropriately, has in, genuinely has in, encouraged awareness, has encouraged inquiry, has encouraged uh, acknowledgement of our energy and, f- and in enough energy just to enlighten our life, enough energy for human beings rather than human doing, doing, doing. Fourth area, of course, we've been touching upon this on the uh, days uh, uh, together quite a lot with both the next two factors and uh, that is uh, um, happiness and joy that sense of um, uh, gladness and calmness of the experiences of uh, vibrancy and vitality and serenity and those two uh, there really matter a, a, gr- a great deal. And one of the aspects of that which is important is, and it's not always so easy, and that is to be able to distinguish in life between, uh, in terms of happiness and joy, and pleasure, in, in, in Dharma language here for a moment. And uh, pleasure, in the uh, way we use it, and I think in secular life as well is arriving and we're experiencing it as a result of putting energy, time, knowledge, focus, priority towards getting something. And when that which we're after, we get. The fruit of that effort to get that gives us pleasure. And it's not that Dharma teachings is obviously against pleasure, but at least what we move towards in life, or who, or where, or whatever it, it might be, that though the intention can start from within, the movement towards, in all the ways that you and I will, will do that, there is, ne- of course, never any real assurance that what we move towards guarantees the pleasure. And even that which we move towards, and as we all know only too well, that which we move towards, which gave us pleasure, may become, sooner or later, one big pain in the neck. And anything, anything. And we know this 
with uh, some new equipment. <laughs> Somebody at Gaia House decided some time ago <laughs> we need good equipment at Gaia House. There was a huge library there and and, and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And then one looks at it, all those buttons, it's like computers. I remember I was a hack reporter in the late nineteen sixties. Little typewriter, stop, 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 stop. Now, in, it's gone to another level. So many things that we move towards make life so complicated and so difficult, and we, 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 we call this evolutionary process. Others call it madness. And this movement, everything, the compelling factor, the conditioning factor pulls us all along. And it isn't easy for any of us to see in that movement that whatever gives us uh, pleasure, whatever it might be, the same thing as they say can become uh, a real hassle in our life. And I'm not only talking about the non-human world. Marriages, sometimes 50% of them, in London apparently, made in heaven and finish in hell. <laughs> that more than half the population of London <coughs> is now living alone. So the, the, the city is becoming like a huge bedsit land. And people are finding it important and valuable to, to do that and it's people's uh, uh, right to do that, I think it's a tremendous potential for lots of our understanding and realization can come in that aloneness as much as it can come in togetherness, uh, uh, etc. But it's still that watchfulness of the movement towards the dependency that can arise in that movement uh, uh, towards. And sometimes, if we're not well and content with ourselves, then in that movement towards, it, if we succeed, it can produce uh, pleasure, and marvellous it is, but it still requires wisdom to acknowledge changes that take place. And if, it, if we don't succeed in what we want to move towards, it's just not happening for us, whatever that uh, might be. That also obviously requires wisdom as well, simply because life is not made to fit in with one's wishes. Life doesn't work like that. And the poor old self just doesn't get it. It becomes <laughs> utterly convinced that life exists for one reason only, to satisfy the self. Life exists not to satisfy it. It doesn't care a stuff about the self. And every issue, every problem, every unhappiness, every conflict, every confusion, every way that goes on with it, with us, is a sheer confirmation that for life, how little importance there is in the self. It's just not in life a concern. Now either we're going to be in touch with life as it is, or shrink, and I mean this, shrink our consciousness, which has the tremendous potential to be open and expansive and happy, to shrink it right down to the little whims of the self. And then life. Because what happens is we keep seeing what isn't right, what should be better, what should be different. And we shrink and shrink around that idea of life should be fitting in with what I want and when it isn't going right it should be different. And 
and that not only shows itself personally, of course, but it also shows itself on the larger scale of things. So much bean of publicity about British railways, trains not running on time, where there's a, a war going on in the Middle East. I mean, where are the priorities? If trains don't turn up on time, good. More practice for impermanence, letting go and the insecurity of existence. Excellent. <laughs> what we want is more leaves on the line. <laughs> Just to get out of the mindset of things should be as we want them to be. I remember once in dear old Mother India, the train running from Delhi to Madras, due in Madras at 9.30 in the morning. And they were so happy. The train arrived at 9.30 in the morning. People waiting to put a garland around the, the neck of the driver. <laughs> <laughs> really. And then he said, but madam, this train is 24 hours late. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So sometimes, just moving, (laughs) taking the the, uh, view so that we're kind of moving out from this kind of conditioned, restricted, socialized, secularized view of existence. Beginning to sense things in a different way. And therefore, what the self wants matters less than what's going on matters more than our relationship to it. And we're not, as especially in the English culture, got this rabid attitude of complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining. We become masters of complaining. And therefore it needs, needs some other kind of shift. And then perhaps out of the happiness and the spaciousness and the allowance of, of things and being clear about what is. But out of that, there's a kind of ongoing process for us of a certain kind of waking up that's going on. That we can't control life. To help keep stable amid mid things. Just get, I'm not, I just thought of another railway story. I do, I like, I like uh, railway. I was on the train from Totnes to Plymouth. It takes about half an hour. Well, it's supposed to take half an hour. And at Plymouth, one can get the overnight sleeper. So quite often I have an early flight out somewhere or other. So sometimes I get the overnight uh, sleeper and then they let you sleep in at Paddington Station and then get to the airport six, seven or whatever it is and then take the flight out where, wherever it might be. So, some months ago, got on the train, Virgin, uh, uh, train down to Plymouth to get the overnight sleep up to Paddington. About 20 minutes into the journey going down, the train broke down. We were stuck there at 10.30 at night, uh, there. And an hour, an hour and a half went by. So I said to one of the staff on the train, just after midnight, the train leaves to go up to London, because they've got to fly out somewhere or other. So they waited for another train to come down the line. And the member of the staff rang the train at Plymouth Station. Both sleepers and passengers there. And said, would they mind 
waiting. Because there's one passenger who'd like to get on that train to come up to London. And they kindly waited. And another train coming down pushed us. <laughs> our train, for 10 or 15 miles, literally pushed our train into Plymouth Railway Station. And so we got in, and then the train going up, and I was getting, the driver was there, and they just waited, he said, no problem. And we went off about half an hour, 45 minutes late. So I, I thought, in that kind of uh, uh, situation, yeah. I think the kindness is often gets forgotten, the good spirit that, go, uh, that uh, uh, goes on, and the good will, in this case. So, it's not that it's very nice of the driver to wait and have an extra cup of tea. And sometimes we miss all of that because we're so fixated about the time, and we're fixated about things that should be the way that we want them, we can miss much else of what's going on. I mean, that aspect of all, all of that is a contribution in a way to helping us and reminding us how important it is in life to kind of break free from our fixated ideas. I mean, how many of us are going to remember what well, I did, but how many are going to remember planes and trains arriving late or whatever? Who cares? Awareness, inquiry, energy, happiness. Got to remember that feel right now. Calmness. And one important factor here is this samadhi. That the ability, when things are difficult or all the ways that they can be or inconvenient or whatever, that means that the samadhi is the factor of concentration, the factor which helps us to stay steady. Just to stay steady. And if you and I, during our time here, are genuinely cultivating the capacity to be concentrated on just ordinary things like the breath, like the meal, like the walking, like the listening, or whatever, we're just, in ordinary things, developing that capacity for samadhi, for concentration, then uh, there are times, and there are important times, when we really need to concentrate. We really need to. And that may be in a crisis that somebody is happening around us. It may be in a matter which is very serious. It may be in an area which really requires focused attention without fear, without panic, without worry, that we can act and we can act well clearly and confidently and if we've engaged and developed a real practice of samadhi that resource really will be available to us but if we haven't practiced what very easily happens when the troubles of life come we've got no concentration no focus, no samadhi and our inner life is all over the place fear, worry terror, panic, it runs right into the body, right into the legs, we don't know what to do. And therefore every moment that you and I spend on the meditation cushion, every moment that you and I take with walking, of focusing and concentrating, it develops a great power of the mind. And one of the great powers of the mind is this samadhi for the times when it's really needed and there will be times when it's needed. And the final factor of uh, enlightenment is um, this uh, equanimity. The ability to be balanced and even-handed, even-minded, to be steady rather than pushed and pulled by, about by circumstances. And there are lots of situations, both here and uh, uh, elsewhere, to, to practice that. To learn to be steady. And to see things as an opportunity for that kind of practice. 
So, as a small, <coughs> pardon me, a small example here. Um, uh, I understand that um, with the uh, toilet, some people are very light sleepers. This is a quite a typical thing on uh, uh, retreat. And, of course, then some people need to use the uh, toilet uh, during the night. And if I remember rightly, I think one of the encouragements here is using the toilet rather quietly and uh, not necessary to pull the chain. But some people, thank you, but I'm sure, that out of sheer force of habit, uh, we go to the loo and then we pull the chain, oh, <laughs> and then there's some poor devil sleeping above who gets woken up. Now, what is the, what's the state of mind of the poor person that woke, wakes up? Either the person can then start um, heaping blame on the poor person down below or wherever for not being mindful, not obeying the rules, and very quickly this person is uh, labelled as an abuser of human rights. <laughs> <laughs> and the agitation that goes on prevents one from getting back to sleep. <laughs> there. <coughs> or, the world around, in this case the person, has uh, gone to the toilet and pull the chain or whatever it, it might be, that, you know, close the door too noisily, etc. We can't make the world fit in with what we want. We spend the whole life, it's so exhausting trying to do that. Therefore, in that time, would one dare say to oneself, this moment is the moment to develop equanimity. The thought is, this moment is a moment for that. And if I can't handle someone having a noisy piss in the room next door, <laughs> how am I going to handle the bomb? How am, how am I going to handle dying? How am I going to handle my house being burned down with no toilet left? <laughs> If I can't handle somebody who's just doing their nature. <coughs> so, situations, small, ordinary situations, not easy, not comfortable. We would like people to be more mindful, etc., but we're not. And therefore, in that, can we say, okay, this is a time for equanimity. This is what this practice is all about. And so, therefore, in conclusion, we're, we're, we're taking a genuine interest in awareness, mindfulness, in inquiry, in energy for human beings, in happiness, in joy, in concentration, in equanimity. Because if we really nourish these, we really take an interest in all of these, our life is going to feel close to enlightenment. We begin to understand what an enlightened life is all about. It won't seem theoretical and abstract and something that happened to Sid two and a half thousand years ago. <laughs> Sid short to Siddhartha. <laughs> it actually seem much closer to us. Because the factors are the factors for enlightenment. May all be live with the way. <coughs> May all be beings explore existence. May all beings live a free and enlightened life. Well, let's have a couple of quiet minutes. Thank you for listening. 
To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.